G'day and welcome to the Grow Small Business Podcast. I'm your host, Troy Truen. Each week, we speak with an owner who has grown a business with 5 to 30 team members to something bigger. Diving into their numbers and unearthing the pain they've experienced, we explore what they did to overcome each barrier and what they would do differently from day one. Let's get into it. We'll have all the show notes and any resources mentioned in the cast on our website. In 2001, age 25, over a beer with two mates at the uni bar, they decided to start a business instead of getting real jobs. Almost 20 years later, with a team of 25 FTE and 100 subcontractors and sales of 20 million a year, climbing to 30 million. With two offices in Tasmania, one in Queensland and one in New Zealand, they managed forests for governments and superannuation funds. Funding came from friends and family in 2010 to help expand the business into value-added wood products. From that, two years later, they launched a risky and innovative subsidiary business called Hydrowood where they harvest beautiful Tasmanian timber from the depths of a large lake with a barge and excavator. They have one customer on the mainland that buys 95% of that unique product. The state government provided a $250,000 grant to test the idea, then the Australian government a further $5 million to make the venture a reality. The founders guard recruitment carefully with a no dickhead policy and put their culture first. Hire smart, like-minded people as you can train them. Dave believes the hardest thing in growing a small business is having the courage to do it, get financial management under control, make sure you have something people want to buy. Advice he give himself on day one is work hard, don't give up and focus. Don't diversify, specify. Welcome everyone. Today I'm interviewing David Wise from Hydrawood SFM. Thanks for your time today, Dave. No worries, mate. Uh, do you remember how we met each other some years ago, I think? Oh, look, I think it's either through Rambo or Foden's Business Breakfast, one, yes. one of the two, somewhere along the way. So, yeah. Yeah, I think I might have, yeah, and ran into you at least once down at Hobart Brewing Company for uh, having beers down there, I think. Yeah. More than once, I suspect, yes. Yeah, so we've got a lot of mutual friends, both from a, I guess, from a nature kind of bushwalking circle as well as um, business friends around Tasmania. Yeah. Absolutely. The Hobart thing. Yeah, that's right. So tell our audience a bit about your business, uh, the, you know, the name, where it's located, what it does, how it makes money. Yeah, Hydrowood is our underwater logging operation. So that's mm-hmm. based uh, on the west coast of Tassie, uh, yeah. near a little town called Rosebury and uh, operates on Lake Pyman. Mm-hmm. Um, we've also got a, a warehouse in Lonnie and um, we process all the timber up there. SFM, so that's the sort of the, the broader holding company that's based in Hobart, yep. um, and uh, that's got offices Hobart, Lonnie, Mount Gambier, Tauranga in New Zealand, right? And um, that's uh, that's predominantly it's a forestry company. So we manage estates on behalf of New Forests mm-hmm. um, in Mount Gambier, and just got announced today we won the estate management for the ex Norsky Skog estate in Tasmania. Oh wow. That- that's a big so, paper mill, isn't it? Big paper mill. So the paper mill's retained by Norsky, but yep. um, New Forest has bought the forest bit, which is about it's eighteen and a half thousand hectares of actual forest, and yep. the balance is, is native forest and, yep. and reserves. And um, yeah, we've got the management gig for that. So we fence to fence management stuff, um, do the planting, cut the trees down, um, ensure that the fire management's done properly. Um, there's no illegal logging, all that sort of stuff. So it's a third-party management model, which is pretty common. So uh, they they get money from superannuation companies generally um, and they've formed the uh, Australian New, Ze- New Zealand Forest Fund. Yep. Um, and the ANZA Fund 3 just bought the, the ex-Norsky estate. Right. Yeah, got it. And So, yeah, it's, it's fundamentally, it's a place for superannuation companies to park money and it's a pretty safe, good long-term investment and yep. uh, we, we manage that. Do a yeah. bit for government um, as well these days, and um, generally if they're plant, plantation only, predominantly, yep. mm-hmm. um, we uh, yeah we manage forest and, and cut trees down. Also run exports out of Hobart. Um, yep. You might have noticed there's some ships down there these days with uh, log trucks going backs and forwards. So we uh, we we put put trees on butts. Yep. Yeah. Great. Well, tell the audience a bit about how SFM started out and then I guess the second part because I'm really intrigued by the Hydrawood story in particular, but how did yeah. SFM start out? How did you get into that? Well, a few of us at uni. I don't know if you know JP as well. JP and Andrew Morgan, John Paul Cumming. Um, we yeah. started as a, as a three in 2001. I was doing economics. Um, JP, I think he was lecturing at the time um, in ag science and uh, Andrew was doing botany and also running the computers for um, plant science. So right. 
Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, around the uni bar, got together, beers, <laughs> and things. Jeez, we're going to have to go and get a job at some point. That sounds annoying. Let's start a company. So um, all full of ambition and beer, and uh, away we went. Um, and yeah, got a start. Um, started doing a lot of consulting work um, generally, and all kept our jobs. I was doing. I was still running a farm. Uh, Andrew and and JP were both working at the uni, and uh, we just sort of built it up from there. So very much organic. Um, yep. And um, yeah, continued continued to grow up from that point. Got a bit bigger. Got an office and got all got all grown up. Started signed riding the cars and. <laughs> and uh, yeah, things things grew along. JP went very much down the consulting road, and he's still going very successful in his own. Yeah, we've used him in a few projects, Rambo and I. Uh, yeah, cool. Yeah, he's great. Really good. Yeah, yeah. very good operator. Um, and we went more down the trading route. So we worked a lot for the big MIS companies. You know, you know, you know all, the, all the the star players in that Great Southern FEA guns, etc. Yes. And mm-hmm. um, so we did most of their, a lot of their environmental consulting work, and um, and also managed um, plantation harvesting for them, as yeah. well as still we had a bit of a, we had a pretty big line at, at one stage in still doing um, pure environmental consulting. So we redid the rewrote the flora export guidelines for the Commonwealth government, and some pretty pretty ambitious stuff at the time for a, for a few upstarts. Yep. Yep. Um, and it it kind of it kind of grew from there. Then. Um, MIS obviously had a bit of a dive during the GFC. I, I noticed there's a bit of a theme re- listening to your podcast, yes. the, the, the GFC moments. Yes. So it kicked off in 2008 and they started, they started falling over. So we, uh, we decided that we needed to do some other stuff. Went and um, we did some work in Queensland um, around particularly cyclone-affected um, yeah. recovery and went and got, started an office in Mount Gambier and got a, um, a, that management contract um, for New Forest, which was great, really stable. Yep. And thought we better do something else as well and thought of the Hydrawood idea. Yeah. So as, as you know, I do a, bit of, do a bit of flying as well, sort of got a parallel clear, career as a commercial pilot. Yep. And um, flying down round over Lake Gordon, saw all these trees poking out of the, the empty dam and thought, surely we can do something with that. Fast forward, trip to Canada. Uh, my better half, Christie's Canadian, so... Seeing uh, around her hometown, um, where her dad lives, and um, yeah, we saw them processing timber over there, and it seemed, seemed like an achievable sort of goal to, to try and do something with the Tasmanian resource. Yeah, right. So in Canada, it's quite a big thing to pull old trees out of dams and lakes and process them. Yeah, it's a, it's a really big industry. So the Selwyn Lakes um, through there and Vancouver, a lot of the Canadian forest industry, their trees float, which is really handy as don't, unfortunately. But um, a lot of the timber is actually pushed around uh, in the sea. So Vancouver Island, they go in uh, into the forest inland, cut the tree down, take it to the, the shore and push the trees in the water. Right. And they've got lots of little tugboats and they, they sort yep. the timber out, put it on big ships and then uh, take it to the processing mills and tip the boats over to, to uh, get the timber off. So yeah, right. it's very much a water-based timber economy over there and a lot of the pulp mills and, and sawmills don't actually have any road access they're, right they're just purely water-based in the wow. towns of bc and, and uh Vanco island so yeah and, and, spot. and a lot of the tasmanian some of the tasmanian timber are, uh, is not only rare but also can be quite expensive so i assume there's a lot there, there is some of that in underwater so you're able to recover that and and it's okay it's been waterlogged for so long for like this could be decades it could be under underwater so the stuff we're harvesting in Lake Pyman um, is about you know thirty to forty years old. So that was uh, that was dammed in eighty two, yeah, and it was a living forest standing up. The water levels come up, and what we can see now is the very top bit of the trees poking out. So we had to work out a way to to go down the tree, cut the tree down effectively underwater, and yeah. then pull the surface. So um, a lot of the stuff they're doing in Canada is actually old. Uh, fallen timber and they're recovering it we're actually harvesting a effectively a standing forest but just instead of approaching it from the bottom right ground level, <laughs> we'll approach it from over the top, the top in a boat yeah. The or, boat. Or a barge, so yeah we had to kind of work out a way to do that and um came up with some crazy ideas barges excavators and uh a tugboat system it's and it seems to work okay not 90 percent of what we came up with is functional yep we had a we had a big haul out trailer we, we now refer to as the lemon but uh, that, that we don't <laughs> we just basically didn't need it yeah but um, yeah so excavator sitting on a uh, 
or 12 by 16 metre barge, pretty big excavator, 42 tonner. Yep. And all up the barge weighs close to 200 tonnes. So wow. uh, yep. we can have us we can have a pretty big tree. Yeah, that's great. And before we move on to some key numbers to illustrate the growth, what so what year did you start SFM? How old were you and were you? And also what year did you start Hydrowood? Started SFM in 2001. Yeah, um, I think I've graduated in about 2003, so I was still still doing a couple of subjects, finishing off my degree. Yep. And uh, we started Hydrowood in I was 12, 25, 26, um, in 2001, and uh, started Hydrowood in 2012. Wow, it's been eight years. Okay. Wow. Yeah. So yeah, it's been a little while, and yep. so from from starting it um, in you know, inverted commons to actually pulling a tree out of the ground, we, we didn't pull a, a tree out of the water until 2015. Right. Right. So yeah. we spent the first 18 months uh, doing a whole bunch of historical surveys. So we got the old maps, did all the veg typing, interviewed all the old guys that worked for hydro and forestry back in the day on the West Coast, and they were, they were a rich source of information. Um, did a 3D survey of the lake using mm-hmm. sonar. So we actually had a, a standing model of how much timber we thought was in there. It was about yep. 150,000 cubes, which was a little bit more than we thought. And... Um, very kindly, uh, state growth at the time and hydro themselves actually gave us some money. So I think they gave us 250,000 bucks. Yep. And that enabled us to actually go and do um, all this research and, and start to design the concept around the gear. Yep. Which was, um, which is obviously unique. There was a little bit of it going on in Canada with some, some underwater actual harvesting equipment, mm. but it was much smaller than we needed because as I said, their trees float. So we've got to actually pull this. It's like a rock effectively, a waterlogged tree. Yeah up from underwater, and uh, there's a bit going on in Panama as well. They were doing a bit there, but most of that involves pushing divers over the side with a hydraulic chainsaw. Wow. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, on a on a, uh, on a uh, hooker dive system, which is bloody dangerous. Yes. So yeah, we didn't want to do that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, we sent a couple of guys down just to get a few samples initially just to test that the wood was okay, yep. and uh, they weren't thrilled about about going back in. So, uh, yeah. yeah, it was obviously a very limited thing using divers. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, great. Well, what about any key numbers you can share to show the growth from starting in 2001 to, well, nearly 20 years now? It is very nearly 20 years. So, 2001 started three of us uh, not paying ourselves, organic growth, you know, the usual story. Yep. Um, and I think this year we'll do about 20 mil turnover. and. Yep sort of pro- projected for next financial year should be somewhere between 20 and 30. Great. Well done. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Got about, um, I don't know, 25 staff and yep. probably about 100 subbies. Right. So what would the FTE be then? Uh, like all those subbies are full-time? Uh, yeah. 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 It'll be better full-time. So, so, so ranging from uh, forest scientists, um, people doing um, consulting work on um, fauna and fauna assessments, truck drivers, harvesting contractors, Yep. Uh, yeah, all sorts of things. Yeah, yeah, wow. So 25 in the core team and extended out to 125 when you add in all the subbies as well. Yeah, That's yeah. phenomenal. Wow, well done. So, yeah, it's definitely been a, a um, growth, over, growth over the years. And, yep. uh, and as everyone else has said on the podcast, it's obviously seamless and, and worry-free growth during this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I used to have hair when I started in business. I'm now <laughs> pretty much totally bald. My daughter keeps reminding me I have no hair. Um. And when was the moment you felt like you'd succeeded? Oh, look, there's been a number of points on the way when you can actually start paying yourself a pretty good moment, I think, yeah. Um, yeah. and you start to hire people. It was probably about two or three years in, I think we started to t- take some people on casually. And you know, some of those were mates and um, they helped us grow on the way. And, and then we actually started to get a bit more serious and started to get full-time employees, get an office, yeah, and um, and start to get equipment and that sort of thing. So yeah, really, I, I suppose our growth came in the, in the late noughties. Uh, yeah. We actually started yeah really ramping up that stage. We sort of started getting into the, you know, turning over the, you know, into the millions. Um, and you can actually call yourself, you know, well, we sort of thought we could start calling ourselves a proper proper business. Yeah, right. Um, yeah. And what does success look like to you? Well, I mean, the, the announcement today. I mean, we got that. Um, Norsky or next Norsky estate management gig. Uh, that's really gratifying. We've had management gigs um, on the mainland, and you know, Hydrowood's obviously been a, a, a really good point of success for us. Um, but a self-sustaining business where um, we've got some longevity without having to you know chase the next deal down too hard. Yeah, um, it's nice to get some some subtle uh, 
you know, financial flow through the business. And I think that, you know, that's happened to us, um, you know, probably over the last last 10 years or so. It started to get, um, you know, more and more solidified as we've gone on, built a balance sheet, um, managed to buy our office, uh, which is which was great. Yeah. And, um, yeah, just just smooth the smooth cash flow, which yes. is which is nice. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, not not getting too many surprises along the way. I think that's I think that's the key. Yeah, that's yeah. great. And I guess talking about funding, how how have you funded that growth from the early days of the beer money and not paying yourselves through to you mentioned the two hundred fifty thousand dollars grant from the state government. Any other grants or investment you've taken along the way? Yeah, we got five million out of the feds for yep. the hardwood project, yep. which we were very appreciative of, and because um, we had to actually build, the design, and build all the gear from scratch, and that was mm-hmm. that was pretty expensive. Um, but uh, that continues to today, and uh, apart from the, a bit of paint on the excavator, it's actually it's still going well. We'll probably yep. get another ten years out of that gear, I reckon. Yeah, um, great. We yeah. have to do any major work to it. And we took some f- friends and family funding on in um, about 2015, 2016. Yeah, but the, um, what, I, st- what I term the three Fs, friends, family, f- friends, family and fools. Yeah, That's correct. <laughs> um, particularly around um, when we started production. So we'd always been a consulting business, uh, wood flow business, and then we actually started making stuff, which was really new to us. So we started holding stock. And I'm sure, you know, whiskey background, you, you know all about, all about yep. that. Yep. Um, so we... Cut the tree down, hydro wood. So we just to explain the sort of the supply chain. So we go along in the in the barge uh, excavator, pull the tree out of the ground, put it on our our barge with the tugboat on it, chuff back to shore, pull it off, leave it sitting on the landing for a few weeks usually, then take it to the sawmill and cut it up. And from that point, after we've cut it up, we've got to store it in a shed for about nine months to a year. To dry it out? Yeah, to, yeah. to air dry it. And we've got to do it inside because mm. it doesn't like UV. Right. Once it's dry, it's just normal timber. But because all the sap's been washed out and been replaced with water, yep. you don't want to expose it to bright sunshine and wind and that sort of thing. It deteriorates too quick. Yep. So we've got to put it inside for about nine months to a year, then kiln it. So yep. there's a fair bit of expense in that holding stock. And, um, yeah, we... we Got some, went and got some money to um to fund that through. Banks banks don't like timber, uh, oh, right? So um, you know, it's um, yeah, it was good to uh, yeah to put some put some away. And you need enough to have a meaningful supply chain. So our distributor in Melbourne, uh, they they want to know that we can produce them a, a you know viable volume. Yeah, yeah, yep. great. And just so, yeah, go right to that end. I should I should mention those guys. Delta um, Con, who owns Delta, a massive demolition company, but he also owns a, a wood distribution distribution business in Melbourne. Yep, and uh, he has bought ninety five percent of our product right. on a handshake. Wow, he came down a couple of times, and he's bought everything we've produced. Yeah, apart from special projects we've done around at Hobart and Lonnie, yep. like the Enterprise Centre in Launceston, which has been great. A few projects like that, but um, he's he's basically bought everything we've ever produced. No, oh, great, yeah, yeah, fantastic. And so, just that one round of fund, real funding, then in 2010 from the three Fs, and you have, haven't had to take other investment on. No, we've been we've been pretty lucky. Um, sales have been strong um, yep. for us for the last few years, and uh, we've managed to yeah, just through organic cash flow. Um, you know, as you know, it ta- it's it's the hardest bit about running a small business is keeping the cash flow monster at bay. Yes, um, but we've got some. Uh, we've got a really good financial management team, and yep. um, Tammy, uh, who we're all terrified of, and uh, <laughs> all in line. <laughs> yeah, great. I know the type, and they're perfect for a fast-growing small business. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so, if you were to start up today with plenty of funding, would you go into your industry? And if not, why? And what else would you do? Oh, look. Yes, I think I would. I, I mean, I, I love it. Um, it's great. It's exciting. We get to we get to innovate, and we've done something that no one else has done before in the country. Um, and made it work, which has yep. been nice. Had to go through, we did the, got to do the marketing, um, create a brand, which has got some great recognition. Um, you know, been taken up by Grand Designs, and mm-hmm. you know, um, is is seen as a a a, um, a leading brand in sort of wood architectural wood space. So that's that's been terrific. Um, probably would have done things a bit differently if we knew that the GFC slash managed investment scheme collapse was coming along in the in around 2008 through to about 2011 12 it went for in our industry yeah um would have been would have been nice to know that was coming but generally it's um yeah, it's it's a good industry and um 
you know, it's in our in our current times of of COVID and the, the um, disaster of the world. It's uh, it's nice to see it's actually bobbing along reasonably well. Don't yeah, want, um, don't want to take that uh, take that for granted, but yeah, we're going along okay at the moment. Well, can you outline the most stressful point in your small business journey so far? Look, the hydro thing's pretty interesting. There was a number of stress points on that. Uh, we came up with the idea, built the gear, and look, to be honest, didn't really know it was going to work until mm. uh, our friend uh, Will Gordon, who was managing the build, uh, put the gear on the lake over on the west coast, and we started pulling trees out of the water and went, gee, I hope this works. <laughs> um, <laughs> yep. So that, that was certainly a stress point. Um, and it did. Uh, getting getting the sales and distributions channels right for Hydrowood was was really interesting. And we thought that the technical challenge for Hydrowood was going to be pulling a tree out from underneath the water and um, and getting it to shore. That actually turned out to be the easy bit. Right. The hard bit is getting it dry properly. Mm-hmm. Yep. And getting it refined to a point that the market would accept. Yeah. We thought that we were going to sell rough sawn boards. Market doesn't want that. They want to go in to a shop and buy a board as if it's come from Bunnings. It's dressed all round and it's recognisable to them. So we had to really change the way that we approached it, um, yeah. and it ended up taking up a lot more capital. But um, late, yeah, lucky we were about, we were about to fund that. But yeah, look, there was certainly some certainly some stressful times through there. Yep. Um, and obviously, the yeah, as everyone's mentioned, the GFC. It was just yeah. it was just no one saw that coming. Yeah. And um, you know, I think we lost something like 80 percent of our sales overnight wow it, yeah. yeah it was it was a big hit so, yep. yeah yeah and what area in business do you feel you've had to work on the most to add the greatest value me personally yeah oh uh, yeah trying to stop micromanaging people um, <laughs> it's, it's always a is always a problem being patient yeah. Um, that sort of thing. You know, people are pretty smart. We pride ourselves on hiring smart people that can think for themselves. We don't. We don't have a culture of people clocking on or off. There's no. Yeah. There's no time, um, and it's been particularly good at the moment um, because everyone is working independently from home, and we haven't actually had to change much of what we do. And it just goes to show that yeah, we've we've picked pretty good people, and, and they can function themselves. They don't. They don't. Um, they don't always need us to uh, to manage them that closely. So yeah, that that that's probably. Uh, a fault. Um, yep. I, I'd say if you ask for staff, there's probably a long, long, long list, but uh, that's the main one I can come up with. Yeah, great. And what have you enjoyed the least about managing the fast growth? Um, oh, look, you know, keeping keeping on top of um, logistics is a big thing for us. Mm. Um, and obviously, you've got to make sure that you're on top of the financial management. I mean, I've got a financial management qualification, I suppose. So that certainly helped. And um, Andrew, is although he's actually a botanist, he's he's got a really good financial brain. So, um, you know, right. getting those getting those things in place and, and putting discipline around cash flow and cash flow management is just so bloody important, particularly early on um, when you go from, you know, just we I think we called ourselves the goodies in the early days. We'd do anything, <laughs> anywhere, anytime. Yep. Um, through to actually being a, a, you know, a grown up business, um, that transition period from I don't know, you know, two thousand one through those early first few years, yeah, we it was a really steep learning curve. Yeah. yeah. Yep. And what's the number one habit you think a small business owner needs to develop and maintain? Well, hard work's probably way up the list. I reckon. Mm. Um, I was thinking about this as yeah. I think not bullshitting yourself um, yeah. and actually recognising when you do make a mistake and being honest about it because you don't want to, if you've had an idea, you, you go out there and prosecute it and it, it's hard to, to look yourself in the mirror and go, right, that's actually, I'm wrong. Um, yes. I need to change that really quickly. And it's interesting, as you've got more experienced, you're much more likely to take that message on board and go, right, well, that's a mistake and change it faster and faster Yeah, um, and not get stressed about it. So. Yeah. I think that's um, yeah that that's a really that's a really key point I reckon and you know be honest with yourself and be honest with everyone when you deal with too we try and do that as much as we can um, you know just be honest with staff customers clients and, yeah um, it seems to be rewarded sometimes it's the it's the long road when your competition might be uh, uh, be, be um, yielding a little bit of touch in terms of the way they're marketing things but um, yeah we're trying you know, try and be just as straight up and down as we can. Yeah, great. Yeah, that's a good point about uh, shooting down shit ideas uh, over the last... Oh, so I've been in small business uh, 20 years, I think one year ahead of you, maybe two years, but um, is having mentors, coaches around you, whether formally or informally, 
uh, and, and a board, whether it's a board of directors or a board of advisors, for people to say, well, hang on, that doesn't make sense. This, let's really look at these numbers or challenge that idea and that thinking. It helps you take the emotion out of it because if you've come up with the idea and you've already done some work on it, often you can be emotionally attached to it. And I've mm. found that that's really helped me um, stop going down paths that were, you know, weren't going to work by having people challenge my thinking and uh, particularly in the last 10 years, being a lot more open to that. Yeah, and it was certainly interesting. When we first came up with the hydro concept, most people thought we were completely nuts, but we <laughs> did stick to that one because we yep. we knew it had bloody work. But, um, yeah, we had uh, had some people tell us we were mad. But, yep. uh, yeah, it's, it's, nice, it's nice to see it succeeded. But. Yeah. Do you love talking small business growth with other owners? We have a vibrant online community from many industries around the world. Plus, we regularly add new tools and resources for community members and host two webinars a month to help you grow your small business. GrowSmallBusiness.com Can you talk to how you added people to the team, some wins, mistakes and advice for those listening? Yeah, look, culture is our number one thing. So we try and hire people. Some of our people obviously need qualifications. So Shane, who drives the and uh, drives the excavator for us on the West Coast, he's got a Master 3 Mariner's qualification. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that takes 10, 15 years' experience to get. Wow. But yeah. we need people who have got fit our culture first and then we'll look for the qualifications they require. Yeah, yeah I think that's so and important. Mm. Absolutely. Mm. Experience is really important and, um, yeah, you can train people to do things. If you got if you hire smart people that are like-minded, mm. you can train them to do stuff. Yeah, one of my recruitment sayings is you hire for attitude and aptitude because if they're clued on, clued in smart people, if they uh, there's something in the uk i think is quite interesting when i moved over there years ago a lot of the accounting firms even the big four over there you don't have to do accounting at university to become an accountant they yeah. just want smart people so you could have done um, biology or chemistry or something at uni and majored in that and a high proportion of accountants in the uk didn't formally study it at university because they know no we want the right people with the right attitude and who can learn things quickly and we'll teach them what they need yeah Absolutely. So getting getting that team together and we've been lucky that we've got a lot of people that have ticked over the 10 years with us. Wow, that's, that's good. That's yeah. been really nice. Yeah. Well, so That leads into what are some of the things you recommend to building and uh, – sorry. Uh, that leads into what are some things you'd recommend to building a sustainable and kick-ass culture to help with the growth? Yeah, make sure people fit in. Yeah. You know? um, that, that cultural fit's really important. You don't want to bring people in that are going to disrupt the team. Yeah. And – Often we hire by reputation, so we'll actually go and we'll actually go and source people deliberately, yeah, right? Um, yeah. That we might know or have a reputation uh, of being good operators in the in the sector, uh, rather than going down the traditional interview role. Sometimes we do, but um, mostly it's about actually targeting people that we think are going to do well and giving the other staff around us the opportunity to actually be involved in that decision too. Yeah, that's it, great. Yeah, yeah. It give it gives them. Not total, but pretty well a right of veto. If they really don't want someone, we won't bring them in. Yeah. That's great. That's really good. Protecting the culture. So it starts at the, the top of the funnel. You don't let anyone in the door or on the bus, as Jim Collins calls it, um, if they don't pass the dickhead test. If they don't Absolutely. Fit. Yeah, no dickheads. And give, <laughs> yeah, give, give, give the staff some power because yeah. Yeah, yeah. they're pretty important. And how much professional development did you invest in yourself over the years? Courses, books, podcasts, training, conferences and stuff? Um. I've done a hell of a lot of aviation professional yes. development, so yeah. I actually got you know got to the stage of being uh, you know, instructor in one of the senior pilots and 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 that sort of stuff. So I've worked really hard at that, and I've taken a hell of a lot. Well, it's not directly business stuff, but I took a hell of a lot of what away from aviation in terms of discipline yeah. and decision making. So there's no ability if in aviation to be able to not make a decision because the consequences can be really serious and very immediate yes so I, a lot of that got transferred across and it was really good training and i had some i had some great mentors in that space that um yeah it, it, I, I learned a hell of a lot um so that's from that perspective and um yeah look i do, I do like to read so uh, newspapers fin review um and uh, all that kind of stuff keep up to date and um yes yeah, contemporary uh, contemporary things but um also uh, yeah branson's book got a lot out of that um yep. the google story i find that really interesting about particularly from the google book the thing i took away from that was the a's higher b's and b's higher c's methodology and yeah 
us as principals, keeping the direct hiring thing was so vitally important. So we've never outsourced that yep. down the food chain mm. at all. We've always made sure that we've got to be able to deal with the people and and um, like them to yep. be able to. Come That's work good. So, Very powerful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that was pretty interesting. Yeah. What about you mentioned mentors, coaches? Um, have you had those over the last twenty years, or formally or informally? I guess. We yeah we have um, we've had a few through the the state government programs we we got a couple of people and proved invaluable so um Jeff Fader I think he's head of the Small Business Council now okay. he came and had a few sessions with us that that was invaluable and that that was um that was pro bono I think it was funded through state growth yeah. and um, Greg Hudson he's been um he's been there for a long time with us now and I think he's he's given advice to a number of people around Hobart and. Yeah. Uh, he still. I sent him an email, you know, this morning. Mm-hmm. So he's uh, he's an invaluable, invaluable mentor, and um, just is prone to telling the truth, which is, <laughs> which is great. He's very uh, direct. Very direct, which is yeah. fantastic. So, yeah, that's yeah. that's uh, I. That is my like one of my I guess my natural state is I'm very rational and factual and direct, which I have to curb when I'm working with a team of people, but when I'm with other business owners. I can be the more natural me, I guess, and that really bears out in my work as chair of the Hobart Brewing Company here, and I really revel that time because I, I talk, that's my next question, is whether you've got a board of directors or advisors, but I talk, talk about boards as uh, intellectual piranhas. So you, you've got an issue in the business, you th- throw it on the table and they tear it apart and they don't attack the person, they attack the issue, mm. um, and obviously really smart people that just rationally work through a problem or an opportunity um, and I've found, uh, yeah, that kind of work in the last couple of years really, really enjoyable. Yeah, it's so so important to have people to, to bounce things off mm. uh, and just in the act of explaining it or writing yeah. it out in an email, half the time I'll get through something and delete it. And, <laughs> yeah, that's a that's stupid idea. Stupid idea. <laughs> <laughs> let's, yeah. let's not do that. Yeah, good. So do you have a board of directors? We, yeah, we do. Um, yep. SFM overarching has got a board of directors, so it's just Andrew, myself, and my old man as well. Is on yep. So, um, yeah, he's been he's been in business for a hell of a long time, so he's a, yeah, he's a great sounding board. And would, is he the chair? Or? He is the chair, yes. Yeah, yeah great. Now, I find that role really intriguing. I first came across an effective board and chair, I guess, my time at Lark, um, and and I'm really enjoying that role that I do now at the brewery and a couple other businesses. Yeah, it's a really yeah, it's yeah. super important. And I went and did the um, uh, Institute of Company Directors course a few years ago and did the role of the chairman one as well with those guys. That was yep. that was really useful. Sort of knowing where you sit in terms of legalities and and um, yep. responsibilities as a director. That was that was really good. Yeah. And, and out of interest, you meet monthly or quarterly or. 11 times a year usually about, yeah, about monthly or yeah bi-monthly probably yeah usually. great yeah. yeah all right we're in the final five questions what do you think is the hardest thing in growing a small business mm, it's, a, it's a good one um i think having having the courage to do it um and being able to you know properly really get that financial management stuff under control and making sure that you're selling something that people want to buy yeah. is, is, probably, is probably the big thing because a lot of small businesses want to go out and sell something that they want to do and that doesn't necessarily have a market for it. So, you know, matching that market it, um, to, to your business is, is really important. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a good point because we often live in a bubble and we think we know what the market wants, but sometimes we aren't the market or the target market. So having those, again, advisors around you, coaches, mentors, or even a board, that will challenge you and say, hang on, have you tested this? Where's the data? We know that there is demand for this new product or, you know, there's enough demand in the market. It's really important. Mm. And look, when we were doing a lot of consulting work, I think we sat down with Greg at one point and, um, you know, we, we had Hydrawood going and had the forestry business and also doing some consulting. He said, look, basically you've got three sides of the business. Um, where's all the cost? And we went, oh, it's all in the consulting business. Yeah. Said, oh, where's all the profits? Said, oh, it's over in these two. Over here. Said, we'll stop doing that one. We went, oh, right, yeah. No yeah. <laughs> it, it often takes, and no pun intended, but for someone to be standing outside the forest to be able to see the trees where you guys are in the middle of the forest. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And what's your favourite business book which has helped you the most? Oh, look, I did love Branson's book. I thought that was, you know, in his, it, there's been a couple of iterations of it. Um, yep. I think Losing My Virginity, I think it is. That, yes. that, that's been a, yeah, that, that's a good read, I think. is Yeah, 
he's he's pretty upfront about what he's doing. And, yeah, uh, yeah, that, that's been a great one, I reckon. Yeah. Any great podcasts or online learning tools you use for your own professional development? I'll give my friend Faden a plug with his uh, <laughs> open the pod, pod bay doors because that uh, I do actually do actually listen to that. that. That's a great one. I have um, listened to a couple of episodes. Yeah, it's good. The small business big marketing one. Mm-hmm. Um, have you got into that? No, is it yeah, big yeah. marketing focus? It's yeah, very much a marketing focus, but uh, it goes through a lot of founder stories and, and yep. that sort of thing as well. So yep. yeah, small small business big marketing. I like that one and. Um, I heard you talk about Simon Sinek previously. Yep. Yeah, and I, yeah, he's a smart guy and, you know, focusing that marketing story around why you do things yes. is, um, is really good advice, I reckon. Yeah, yeah his, his TED Talk of 10 or 15 years ago is one of the top 10 TED Talks on the internet most viewed and it just blew me away when I watched it. It's 18 minutes, uses Apple as one of the great, uh, and Martin Luther King Jr., I think, is another one. Mm. Um, I've got a dream, not a plan. I thought that was just genius the way you summed that up. Um, yeah. And, you know, people follow you, not just your customers for your products, but also your team follows you for your why, not what you do it or how you do it. Mm. It was when we did the branding around Hyderwood, we built it as predominantly, a, well, we thought it was like a tourism based product because yep. it, was, it was an experiential thing. And people want to know where the timber's coming from, they want to know it's sustainably sourced, and they want to know why we're doing it and we're doing it so we can go and pull timber that would have otherwise been wasted out of the water and make something beautiful with it. So yeah, that's great. That, and, and people really click into that as to, as to why we're doing it. Yeah. 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 Great. And one tool you'd recommend to help grow a small business? Uh, get some good people to help you get yep. some good advice. Mm-hmm. I reckon um, get as much education as you can from wherever it comes from. It doesn't really matter what it is. Yeah, educate yourself as much as you possibly can, and and uh, and surround yourself with people that are smarter than you. So yep. that's the same goes. Yeah. Yeah. And finally, my favourite question: What would you tell yourself on day one of starting out after you, after you've left the pub? Uh, go and get a job in the public service. No. <laughs> go and get a job in the public service. Oh my no, god. No, not at all. Oh look. <laughs> I don't know, buddy. Uh, you know, work hard, don't give up. Um, you know, if stay focused. Uh, don't spread yourself too thin and, and go down too many rabbit holes at once. Just mm. eat the things you're actually good at, and people want to buy and do that well. Yeah. Um, don't don't spread it too. Don't you know, the diverse the diversification strategy can be a really bloody dangerous one. I reckon. Absolutely. Uh, don't diversify, specialize. Just do what you do well, and and keep doing that. Yeah, sweet mother of God. I made that mistake early on. I th- we had four or five companies at once. Our holding company was called Opportunity Junkies because we just mm-hmm. jumped at anything, basically. They're all in the tech space. But yeah, if I had my time again, exactly, I'd be much uh, you know, more focused. Time's our most precious resource. It's non-renewable. You can't make any more of it. And even just your creative um, abilities, uh, focusing on, on one key business or ideas, you know, it's just much more powerful than splaying your resources, time, money, and energy on too many things. Mm. Yeah, you know, BHP can do it. Um, <laughs> they've got, you know, teams of thousands and all sorts of stuff. But small business people, um, you've really got to, yeah, you've really got to use, like, utilize that precious time well because you, you're probably only productive at your best for a few hours a day. Yeah. And you've really got to focus those hours in and where, where they can, I reckon. Yeah, there's a great book I listened to early last year, around Christmas year and a bit ago, by Cal Newport called Deep Work. And he, he talks a lot about that, getting into the zone, protecting that creative time where you can go deep on a strategic piece of work. And he said there's only two to about two to four hours a day you've got enough energy to really get in that zone. Even the best, I think he used the example of um, a symphony orchestra uh, musicians, they they only practice no more than four hours a day because they're mentally and creatively exhausted after that time. That's it, you know. There's mm. no, no point. Mm. Yeah, you've only you've only got a certain yeah a certain amount of high level thinking time a day, and yeah, you've got to use it well. Yeah. yeah. Well, Dave, thanks for your time today. I think the audience will get a, a shit ton of value out of what you shared with us. Really interesting journey and story, and congratulations on twenty years of of growth after that beer at the uni pub with your mates. And, Thank you very much. No, I appreciate your time and. Um, Look, yeah, great, great to tell the story. It's the first time I've actually ever, it was a great experience to actually write it out and went, oh, geez, there we go. It is nearly <laughs> 20 years and we did all those things. So it's, no, it's been useful. Yeah. yeah, well done. Congratulations. All right. Cheers, mate. Thanks, Thanks mate. And for our audience, we would greatly appreciate a review in iTunes or whatever platform you listen to us on. More reviews means we bubble up higher in iTunes, etc. So more business owners looking for podcasts to help with their growth will find us. 